Welcome to the Multifamily Investor Nation podcast. I'm excited about our, our, our guest today. Our guest today is, is going to be uh, Sandia Sashadri, and I want to welcome you to the podcast and looking forward to your interview today. Thank you so much for having me here, Dan. I have seen you on stage and it's very exciting to be here as your guest on a podcast. Awesome. Well, I'm looking forward to diving into this property called Cedar Square out of Dallas, Texas. I know we've talked about it a little bit before we got started in the green room. 116 doors. You guys closed this uh, December 2020, uh, just before the end of the year. And before we dive into this particular acquisition, why don't you share with our audience a little bit about your background, about who you are and where you are right now on the multifamily side of things? So I'm a Dallas resident for the last 30 plus years. I have a background in electrical engineering as well as an MBA. I did the corporate rat race for over a decade. I'm your typical Asian geek, you know, went to school, got a job, got my degree and worked on that for a while. And then realized the business folks make all the big bucks and decisions around. So I got myself an MBA, went into the stock market. And then once I had a family and children, I went full time into the stock market and realized I was paying too much in taxes. So uh, considered single family, but didn't want to do the whole tenants, toilet, trash, and termites, the four T's as I call them. And so when I heard about multifamily, I got into it about two and a half years ago. I have done about 20 passive deals and I'm active on three deals on the uh, GP side. And it's been a very exciting journey, very fulfilling in the sense that you get to decide your schedule like an entrepreneur does. And it gives me time with my family and a very intellectually and satisfying role in improving communities. So talking about this particular one, the Cedar mm -hmm. Square property, mm -hmm. uh, how many acquisitions ha did you had you had prior to this one? I was on the GP side on two other deals prior to this one. So this will be my third deal, but I'm an active asset manager on this and one other deal. So talk to us about how you sourced and how you found this one. So this deal was listed by a popular broker, Marcus and Millichap in the Dallas area. And this was around the fall of 2020, when a lot of us had come out of the COVID era and were chasing deals and there was suddenly a huge flood of deals. So this almost went below the radar for a lot of people because this is an older property built in the 60s with a chiller, which a lot of people like to stay away from. And secondly, uh, there was a large prepayment penalty associated with this deal. So you have to assume the loan at a fairly high interest rate. So there were not as many people going after the deal. In fact, the broker called me and said, Sandy, you need to take a look at this deal. This deal looks good. Look at the T3, look at the T1. There's a lot of potential. And I still said, I don't want to mess with an assumption deal, et cetera. And then again, more people in our group started looking at the deal. I'm part of a larger mentoring program. And so when two newer people, meaning they have never syndicated a deal before, they looked at it, they underwrote it, and it looked really promising. Then I said, all right, I have to take a look. The deal was in a good neighborhood, uh, near a school, et cetera. So it checked a lot of the boxes. So I got over my fear of chiller properties, and I underwrote it, and it independently, and it made sense. So that's why I joined them in this deal. That's what I was going to say is, as you already said, 1960s, you said chiller, you said prepaid, you said assumption, all of those would be things that I would say no to this kind of a deal. Exactly. So you know, walk me through your thought process here, because I know obviously you talked a little bit about knowing that other people in the group were looking at it and, and kind of build your confidence in it. Was that kind of the main thing? The main thing was that two coaches I trust and people who underwrote this deal, the co person who brokered this deal a couple of years ago, uh, the story was very compelling. The owner was a single sole owner of this property who had 1031 exchanged a bunch of properties to buy this property. He was under a tight timeline. So he kind of bought this property two years ago. And uh, he's located in the West Coast with no one as boots on the ground. So the, everything about this property was all about taking it on, focusing a lot of time and attention to it and improving the operational efficiencies. So once I looked closely at the numbers, I saw the potential. I also looked at the list price of 80,000 per door for a property in Dallas, 10 minutes from downtown, but not in South Dallas, not in a high crime area, but in a safe residential neighborhood three doors from a school, it checked too many boxes for me to just ignore it. And so the more I looked at it, underwrote it, did my drive-bys by day, by night, did the comp studies, it's like, okay, 
I can see why the numbers work, even with a large prepayment penalty. So once you actually got this deal from the broker, at what point during this process did you actually go out and tour the properties? I know you mentioned actually going in and actually doing your comp analysis, shopping it at night, during the day, kind of doing your proper due diligence on it. At what point did you actually go on the property and actually tour it along with the broker? Um, I actually uh, did that before the offers, right before the last day when the offers were due, just to do a quick check for myself. And I did it a little bit sneakily, actually. I just went in and introduced myself and knew that my team members were placing an offer and I had to check it out for myself. So with the broker, I ended up doing it after the initial LOI was placed. How many offers do you think were, or do you know, were actually submitted on this project? Not more than 20 for sure, maybe even less than that. Yeah. I mean, like, that's still, still a pretty good number, but I know with Dallas, it's probably on the lower end, correct? Yeah, it's definitely on the low end. Like Dallas, you should get like 50 offers and stuff. 40, 50 is not uncommon, especially in 2021 uh, yeah. on good properties in Dallas. How many rounds of offers did you go through? It was just two rounds. It was uh, best and final. And then pretty much we got picked. Yeah. from our list because um, the seller was also from our same group and the brokers had a very strong relationship with our mentor and our group. So uh, I think we were competing in best and final with uh, two other groups outside of our Dallas network. And uh, we were the preferred ones from that. What was it that made your group stand out? Was it the, the, the mentor group that you're part of that kind of allowed you to be able to stand out as like that extra credibility factor? Mm -hmm. That and we also have a buyer brokerage that we belong to and the buyer broker's strong relationship with the listing broker. So the listing broker was Marcus and Millichap. And uh, this is within the Sumrock group, Brad Sumrock Network. He's got a buyer brokerage as well. And they have very, very good relationship. And so the confidence that we will close the deal on time and that we were picking the assumption loan rather than new debt. So there was, again, greater confidence on closing the deal in 2020 rather than rolling into 2021 because new debt was going to probably uh, get us into 2021. Well, I was going to ask you is, is uh, mm -hmm. what was the time frame that you had to add in there from the term side of things? Because, you know, I've always been told that when you're doing an assumption, it can sometimes take longer than just putting new debt on there. So what's kind of been that? What was your experience on this one? Um, ours was great because this was a Fannie loan assumption and we only had to deal with this agent who was uh, qualified. So we never actually had to take paperwork back and forth to Fannie. So everything was sort of like dealing with uh, a private lender and that's it. And you're done because they were certified authorized by Fannie to act on their behalf. So it was much quicker. We just had to deal with the same two or three people total. And we had a weekly call every week to make sure we were on target. Literally day by day was that if you get this paperwork by this date, we will close by this date. So we closed on December 22nd with still about five business days to spare for the calendar year. Did you have to put up any earnest money deposit on here that maybe potentially went hard day one or what did you guys yes. do there? Hard day one, 1% uh, as always, and uh, we had early access. So we requested one day of due diligence of just the major things that were concerned. So we bought a chiller expert on property. We were able to climb the roofs and look at the air conditioning units because one side, one of the property had AC units. Uh, we were able to inspect the roof. Uh, we looked at the AC units on one building and then the other two were uh, taken care of for the chiller. So we looked at the chiller and we tried to do all the exterior things we could that would you know, cause us to have any concerns. We had someone uh, uh, snake the plumbing lines on the exterior to make sure they were good. Because when you have an older property, that, that would be one of your biggest concerns. So we literally had a team of let's say 15, 20 people um, on that day before 5 p.m. when the money went hard to look at all the major things, CapEx, just for us to know what the deferred maintenance could be. Mm -hmm. And when you got into the due diligence phase, uh, you know, when once you got it under contract, can, or did you have any other issues that came up during that process? 
We did not have any other major surprises. We had already looked as part of our tours on the interiors of a classic versus a nicely upgraded unit. We knew what we were getting into. I have another property that's a 60s property, but in better condition and it's all individual HVAC, but I still knew what kind of deferred maintenance expenses I would get into. So um, there were no other major surprises since then. And even since we took over the property, uh, we had already budgeted for it. And I think it's more of getting over the fear of old properties. If you could just put a number on it to say, this is what it's going to cost me. I will just go ahead and budget, you know, $75,000 for chiller maintenance or something like that. And a chiller expert looks at it and says, hey, this is a new chiller. Um, you're going to have to not have to replace it anytime soon. Uh, and so that, that part of it really uh, helped me get over the hump of old property. Because again, the older the property, the more meat left on the boat in a lot of cases. And so you have more potential to get higher returns for your investors. Now, because this was a, an assumption, right, from you said Fannie Mae, mm -hmm. uh, did, did they still require, you know, the typical inspections and phase one and things like that to be done, even though it was an assumption? Um, very little. Yes. I mean, a fanny inspector still did come in and lender did say there are certain repairs you have to do, but they were very minor. They were like the tears and solar screens kind of things that were, was what made the list rather than major concrete repairs or anything else that is considered a, you know, a hazard to the uh, tenants. So that part was good. And the other nice thing about this being an assumption is that we avoided that nine or 12 month reserves that you had to do on new debt. How did you do that? Because it, because it was because it was a new debt, right? You're right. It's not that. a new debt. It's just yeah. a loan assumption. So none of the reserve requirement was there. So all the capital we raised was available to us right away to do anything we want to. Yeah. And uh, on on this particular deal, what's the overall business plan that you are are, are going to be um, kind of working on with this project? Um, we are going to we're looking at how well we can raise the rents to Proforma. But at the same time, with doing the least of the upgrades in terms of let's only do the upgrades that make sense for this property that tenants actually appreciate and will pay for. So some of the tenants really like having a new stainless steel fridge, but do they really care whether the flooring in the bedroom is carpet or new wood, you know? So we didn't really update everything. We updated it on a selective basis. So I don't have a uniform. Every unit is gonna get this kind of an upgrade and it's gonna be 7K per door. Instead, what can I do for 2K per door and still get my pro forma rent? What is it that the tenant really likes and appreciates and sees the difference? So it's more of a value add, but very selectively rather than a blanket play of every unit is going to look alike and this is what it's going to be. How did you determine what that resident wants, right? Because, you know, we always say, you know, we want to just, you know, give the residents what they want, but, you know, that for what they're willing to pay for. But how mm -hmm. did you go about figuring out what that was for this particular property? So in the due diligence period and also prior to that in visiting comps, we really did a very close rent analysis to know that, okay, this is mainly C-class properties. All the surrounding comps are also similar C-class. People aren't looking for everything premium. That is not the client base here. Some of them like new floors and new um, you know, appliances, countertops, et cetera. But if the floor is tile and it looks fine, do I have to replace it? Maybe I just update the light fixture. So we've been testing it that way and trying to spend the least we have to spend to get the pro forma rent. Also, when it comes to renewals, we offer tenants, do you want a new fridge? Do you want a new light fixture? Do you want some, you know, a different kind of upgrade like a fan instead that'll keep you to uh, renew here because you're a good paying tenant. We also did a survey and our property manager, we kept the same company and the local property manager is well in tune with this kind of a resident base because she lives in another property nearby. And she said that the only reason she's not moving into our property is because she wants a HVAC. She, she would move into one of the units in the one building which, has a, which doesn't have a chiller because she wants that temperature control when it's cold and hot. Even in the winter in Texas, sometimes we have a warm day. So she wants to be able to turn on her air conditioning. But she's well in tune. And so in doing that survey with her, we were able to figure out that this is what the 
property needs. So we're spending $2,000 instead of $7,000 on some of the upgrades and still getting the rent bumps we need to meet performa numbers. And what are those, uh, those average rent bumps that you're looking for? Um, average $100. So $75 to $100 rent bumps. And what's the unit mix that you have? Um, we have one and two and a very small number of three bedrooms. Okay. And I'm assuming it's a $2,000 per door kind of average across all the units, right? No matter what the unit is. Yes. In terms okay. of the upgrades we're willing to do, unless it's a classic unit that's never been updated in over, you know, 20, 30 years kind of level, then yes, that would be an overhaul that might even run us up to 10 K. But the typical units, if the, if something ain't broken, we don't fix it. That's the philosophy. Yeah. So we do cosmetics. So I have what I call a traveling model. So I have a laundry basket in which we take around like nice looking shower curtains, soaps and towels and things like that. And we decorate any unit that is vacant with it. So it looks nice and appealing. And then sometimes the new resident wants to keep all of those accents. And we say, okay, you sign a new lease at these numbers and you get to keep it. And we sell it that way without necessarily having to update everything to reach, achieve that pro forma rent. Or we may just update the living room and the kitchen, but not necessarily all of the bath fixtures and bedroom, et cetera. What are some of the exterior amenity upgrades that you're looking to do as well? Um, at this point, uh, we just wanna clean up the property, make it look nice and appealing. We have gotten bids for um, exterior paint. We are moving the leasing office. Right now it's housed in a two bedroom unit. We're moving that to a one bedroom. So we wanna have the whole curb appeal. Um, we've got a design approved. And so we have ordered the materials for it. That's the next project in, uh, that's going on. So some of the landscape improvements as you drive up to that leasing office and then a brand new signage with a new brand name. That's what's in phase uh, right now for the next three months. So I know we kind of already know what you've done for as far as financing on this particular project, but what is what were the terms of the, of the loan that you guys assumed on this one? Um, this is a loan assumption. It's a little bit pricey in the sense that the interest rate is 5.2%. But we got, because we paid the same price that the seller paid for it two years ago, it was 81% LTV. So we didn't have to go and get another supplemental loan or try to raise a huge amount of money. So that made a big difference to the terms. Um, we only had about nine months of interest only left. So from October, we closed this in December. So from October of 2021, we will be paying the principal down. So um, that's, uh, yeah, that's a fanny loan. That's the, that's the terms of our loan. And so the CapEx dollars, obviously, you guys raised in addition mm -hmm. to the, the kind of, you know, down payment, if you will, on this one. Correct. We raised all the CapEx. And the advantage of that is we get to spend it on whatever we want rather than something specifically that we had to tell the lender up front, because we like to see how the property does and then decide what makes sense to do uh, to get the pro forma rents that we need and make sure it's amenities that the residents want and appreciate. And sometimes you don't know that till you take over and get a pulse for it because we're already able to get pro forma rents on certain units without doing any upgrades. We're just doing a basic make ready on some of them. Sure. Now I do have a question for you about the CapEx dollars because obviously you've raised that up front. I'm assuming it's probably to the tune of about probably three to 400,000, somewhere around in there, maybe, maybe a little bit more than that. Uh, um, it's a lot more than that. It's like actually a million dollars. Okay. Um, and so you obviously have, you know, a significant amount of money sitting there for mm -hmm. CapEx dollars. What are you doing with that money in between the time that you actually spend it and the time that you actually are holding on to it right now? Is there anything that you can do short term with that to be able to earn a little extra money with that? Or is it really just, you know, sitting in a money market or a savings account or even just a checking account until you to deploy it? We had two major projects in mind, one of which was to convert this property from Chiller to HVAC, and we got the bids for it, and uh, we just didn't feel confident that the vendor could pull it off. So we have authorized a small project first, but then that's what the rest of the CapEx is for, is uh, held in reserves to make sure there's, uh, there's no other major deferred maintenance or other issues that come up. But right now, um, you're right, it hasn't earned a huge amount of interest at this point. 
other than another kind of account that our Chase um, bank where we bank at has put it in. That's a little bit higher than a basic money market account. Yeah. That's one of the biggest challenges I see with those extra CapEx dollars is it's a lot, it's an, it's an expensive amount of money to raise up front that you're paying investors for, but then it's sitting there doing nothing for you in the short term. So uh, it's a challenge that everybody has. I was just curious if maybe you guys had, had uh, you know, cracked the code and then what to do with that money instead of just sitting it there and, uh, and basically losing money at that point. So I think the biggest risk was because it's a 60s property that we don't know what we could get into. We also didn't know how bad the delinquency issues would be with the new presidency, et cetera. So that's why we were on a wait and hold rather than let's execute this from day one, period. Yeah, no, that definitely makes sense. So how did you structure this deal with your investors? Um, As far as the equity split, et cetera. Yeah. We uh, gave them a large percentage, so they keep coming back to us. We did not have an acquisition fee involved in this deal. This was uh, other than what we paid the brokers. Uh, we don't have an acquisition fee in most of our deals. That's one of the things Brad likes is to have a low acquisition fee. And if you want to reward yourself, uh, do that like a waterfall split for having done a good job of executing the deal. Uh, but this deal is very much in favor of the passive investors. Um, it's uh, barely 84-16 is the split with 84% going to the passive investors. So it's not a huge money maker from a sponsor point of view, but it is from a passive investor point of view. Um, like I said, we got this for the same price as the seller paid two years ago at 80K per door, which is uh, very uh, not typical in Dallas to pay that kind of a price. And there's already one of our comp properties that's been listed, and I believe under contract for about 115K per door. So even with all the prepayment penalties, we're already ahead of the game uh, from our investors' point of view. And how did you uh, how did you end up raising the capital on this one, and and, and how much were you raising on this one? Um, this raise was three point four million dollars total, and I contributed probably close to I think a little over a million on this part as far as my share goes. But then my sponsor, my partners, also came in with uh, their contributions, and so we uh, raised most of the like my most of my raise came from my network of investors. Um, both within and outside uh, the ecosystem that I'm part of. Okay. And um, on the, on the 3.4 million, how long did it take you to raise that, that kind of money? Um, it took us a two and a half week period with a week of Thanksgiving in between when we did not uh, end up anything happening, right? We had a webinar right before Thanksgiving and then the whole Thanksgiving week, it kind of shut down. And then by the time it was December, people were like, oh, I need a deal that would close this year that would give me the returns I need and the cost seg and bonus debt for this year. So then it became easy. People realized, oh, I didn't know you had a deal. I was busy with Thanksgiving, et cetera. So the total period, I would say. Yeah, well, I would I would definitely say that that the end of the year is always the hardest time to raise money. So being able to pull off a deal like this at the around the right, doing the webinar around Thanksgiving and being able to pull it mm-hmm. off and still closing at the end of the year and giving that that, that depreciation to the investors is is phenomenal for this. Well, thank you. Um, yeah, I think a lot of investors realized they needed some additional tax savings, and so uh, we were able to get them after Thanksgiving holidays when they had that couple of a two week period when they realized we really could close this year. There was not gonna be a delay because we were not dealing directly with the agency uh, part of it that we just had to deal with this one uh, lender. That made it very painless, very, very painless process to close compared to a couple of other agency loans I've been involved in. Yeah. So can you think of any other issues or maybe some things that maybe happened during this entire acquisitions process that might be interesting for us to be able to talk about or or have we pretty much covered everything at this point? I think just the fear that something is old shouldn't put you away. I think you should look at the financials and say, if this makes sense, whatever it is that I fear, like in my case was a chiller, let me get an expert, let me put a dollar amount to it and let me make sure I always keep that money as my reserves so that um, if I had any repairs, I can address it. And so not to walk away from a good deal because of it. Uh, Because I'm looking at, you know, even if I exited in a year's time, I would exceed the IRR I promised my investors. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I, I can't say that about some other newer deals that I've looked at that have basically not cash flowed at all in like 18 months through COVID. Yeah. 
So I have two final questions for you, and they're contrasting questions. And the first, excuse me, the first question is, what did you find that was easiest during this entire acquisitions process on this deal that maybe originally you thought was going to be a little bit more challenging? Just getting through the loan assumption, I thought is a really difficult thing to do. And it turned out to be the easiest thing because our LTV was so high, there was no supplemental to mess with. And you just deal with this one uh, lender instead of the agency. Made it a lot quicker. And then the last question is kind of the opposite of that. What did you find that was a little bit harder that originally maybe you thought was going to be a little bit easier? I really thought I would raise money even quicker. And I forgot that during holidays and especially we've been through a pandemic, um, I thought in like three, four days, I would have all my money wired. And instead it stretched, you know, before Thanksgiving, after Thanksgiving, and then another week. I was like, come on, people, I've been talking to you all this time. You should have wired the money by now. I'm like, yeah, I'm getting to it. It's the holidays. So <laughs> to me, that was probably a bit of a surprise. I don't know. Maybe I was daydreaming, thinking sure. I could get the money faster, but it took me two and a half weeks. No, I think you definitely did a great job, even in the middle of that time frame, to be able to pull it off in two and a half weeks and and get everything in and, and even close on time and 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 even early because you had a little extra, few extra days in there as far as the buffer is concerned. Well, well, how can the listeners reach out to you if they have further questions about this particular acquisition or maybe they want to continue to follow you more? My website is the best way to reach me. It's multifamily 4 ucom where the four is a number four and Y-O-U spelled out. So multifamily 4 ucom and they can provide their name and email address. Um, I've invested passively in 20 deals and learned a lot from it. So I can provide them with a free checklist to vet a sponsorship team before they invest in a deal. Awesome. Awesome. Well, I want to thank you so much, Sandy, for being here and, and sharing all this information about this acquisition. Looking forward to continuing to follow you as you close more deals in 2021 and into the, into the future and uh, looking forward to having you back as well so we can kind of dive into some of those future acquisitions. Fantastic. Thank you so much for having me, Dan. This is awesome. Awesome. 